I'll now call to order the April meeting of the Oxford Planning Commission. You have the agenda before you. Are there any changes or additions to the agenda? All right. Is there a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. There's a motion. Is there a second? Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Commissioner Spragans, how do you vote? Aye. And Commissioner Milam, how do you vote? Uh, aye. All right. Thank you. Uh, any changes or additions to the minutes from the March 11th meeting? If not, I'll entertain a motion to approve the minutes. So moved. The motion to approve the minutes. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Uh, Commissioner Spragans, how do you vote? Aye. And Commissioner Mile? Yes. All right. Ben, do we have a staff report today? Yes, sir. Thank you. Any questions from the commission on the consent agenda? If not, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? Sure. Yes. Is there any anyone in the audience that would like to speak on any of the cases for the consent agenda before? All right. Is there a motion? So moved. Motion to approve the consent agenda. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Commissioner Spragans. How do you vote? I think you're muted. Uh -huh. And Commissioner Milam. Yes. All right. That brings us to our first public hearing, which is a public hearing for case number 3065, Capamaza Construction LLC has filed a request for a variance from the stormwater ordinance for property located at 1013 Jefferson Avenue. Okay. Um, this variance, they're planning to install an underground detention system. Um, <clears throat> the minimum size orifice uh, in a detention outlet structure is three inches. Um, in order to meet the requirements of all the discharges, the two year, the 10 year, the 25, they would have to go smaller than a three inch orifice. The, the flows at the two year level are minimal and we would rather than use the three inch orifice just because it's easier to maintain, won't get clogged up and all that stuff. So the variance is to allow them to use a three inch orifice uh, while not meeting the two year storm. Thank you, sir. Any questions from the commission? I have a question. Um, is it not for a size less than three inches? N no, sir, that, that was a, um, a little misleading. It, the, the, the variance is, is actually to, to allow them not to have to meet the two-year storm. The, the difference is only like 0.1 CFS or something like that over. So we would rather than use the three-inch orifice and not pass the two-year storm at the required rate. Okay. Additional questions? Anyone from the audience? If not, is there a motion on case number 3065 for the variance? Move that we grant the variance with the, uh, let's say there was no staff addition. No conditions. Okay. Uh, there's a motion to approve the variance. Is there a second? Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. All right. Uh, Commissioner Spragans, how do you vote? Yes. And Commissioner Milan. Yes. Thank you, sir. Our next case is case number 3051. Capamaza Construction has filed a request for a site plan review for property located at 1013 Jefferson Avenue. Okay, so this is for the same property that we just heard the variance for. Um, located at the corner of Jefferson Avenue and North 11th Street, it's around a 0.27 acre lot. Applicant proposes to construct a new three-story building on the existing vacant lot. The applicant received approval at the September 2023 meeting of the Historic Preservation Commission for the building's design. Um, the proposed use, a mixed-use building with a commercial ground floor, is allowable in the Historic Urban Center um, District. Six residential units are proposed on the upper floors. Um, on-site parking is not required for any allowed use in the Historic Urban Center where on-street or nearby public parking exists. Um, and this building does sit across from the city's parking garage. However, the applicant has chosen to include seven parking spots, one of which will be ADA accessible. Um, the plan meets the requirements of the Land Development Code in terms of coverage. 
um, structure height and it meets the setback um, and front yard build two lines as required in the <coughs> district. Um, tree mitigation is not required. There's no existing trees on the lot that will be removed from construction and the required um, foundation plantings and screening are shown in the landscape plan. Um, as we stated earlier, the design was approved by the Historic Preservation Commission. Uh, the engineering department provided comments on access, um, water and sewer, constru construction staging plan, um, and stormwater management. And staff is recommending approval of the site plan with five conditions. All right. Any questions from the commission on the site plan? Yeah, fair question. The, um, the there's discussion about the or two sentences about the broadening of North Eleven. In the staff report. Yes, under the access streets under engineering comments, it just says North Eleven is required to widen to 20 feet to comply with the fire code requirements. Yes, sir. They're going to widen the street on the east side of the existing sidewalk on that side of the road. It's about two feet, I think. Okay. It just says that uh, they have not been approved yet. I mean, is that we're going to have a condition for that to happen, or is that just independent? Uh, well, it would be a condition of, of them moving forward with construction. Yes, sir. But that, that, that should be an issue. Do we need to have that as one of these conditions here? It's not a staff condition. That's the that yeah. My name is Jeff Williams from Williams Engineering, representing this case. Uh, the street widening was uh, a long and drawn out discussion with the city, and we, we come to terms that we were going to have to widen the street. So I presented some preliminary sketches before I submitted the, um, the final plans for approval by widening one foot on each side of the existing road to go from 18 feet to 20 feet, which would meet the fire code or the uh, fire department's concerns as far as the width. Um, I think what John's trying to say is it's a part of the plans and it's, it's, it's been approved that if we build it 20 feet, then we will meet the requirements for the fire code. Okay. Yeah, it's part of the site plan, I guess. Right. right. Additional questions from the commission? Commissioner Spragans or Milam, any questions? Not right now. All right. Would anyone from the audience like to speak? Um, Stuart Paval, I'm the architect on the job. I want, just a few things I want to fill in before I think sure. some neighbors are going to want to come up and speak as well, probably. Um, and real quick on the fire department, I, I would say it probably doesn't need to be a condition of approval because um, to get building permits, fire department is going to be checking that off when we go to get building permits. So um, that was something that we had to go through a lot of hoops to make them happy. So I just wanted to fill in a few gaps on on. on the um, staff presentation and just introduce the project a little more in depth. Um, it's going to be 4,500 square feet of commercial space on the ground floor with two floors of residential condos above. Um, the condos above are going to range, there's, there's six condos, three on each floor. They're going to range in size from 1,700 to 2,100 per square feet, uh, um, three on each floor. Um, per the zoning requirements, as Kate noted, we don't have to provide parking, however, market dictates we need to provide some parking spaces for the condo, so we're doing one per space with one additional accessible parking space. Um, there is a small quarter to share drop off at the front off of Jefferson. Um, this is <clears throat> for the resident or for the commercial use there. It's not parking, it's short term drop off and pick up only. Um, that's an important thing I want to I want to note and that is a holdover from previous versions when this was um, a hotel before uh, on this site. So to that point, um, this site was in, uh, prior to 2008, this was a restaurant that was uh, removed from the site. Since then, this uh, commission and staff has seen this in various forms over the years. Um, the most recent approval that was granted to it was for a hotel. That hotel had a restaurant and bar on the ground floor and then a rooftop bar as well on the, on the roof. Um, I want to 
point out that this is a much less intense use than a hotel with restaurant and bar and a bar on the roof. Um, we have gained COA from the Historic Preservation Commission, as Kate noted. Um, we have now gained our variance request for the stormwater, so otherwise this is um, pretty much meeting the requirements of planning and zoning. Um, it's, I guess, what you would refer to as by right now that we've, you know, outside of the variance that we've granted or been granted now. Um, so a few things I want to address. There was a letter from a concerned neighbor that was provided, and I want to address a, a few things off of that letter if I can, and then I'll, I'll be done. Um, the question of the anticipated use for the commercial space. So uh, what we will say right now is that as of right now, the anticipated use is a, is a daytime hours, light commercial use. Um, at this stage, they don't want to disclose exactly what the actual use is going to be, like what the tenant or the business is going to be, um, but it, would be it will be considered, as of right now with their plan, a light commercial use. And as an architect, I can tell you I've not designed anything into this building that would, would be the infrastructure for a restaurant or, or bar. Um, then I wanna, I wanna comment on uh, the, the question of commercial on Jefferson and the commercial on North Lamar in general. Um, this is really the last street that hits North Lamar that has significant commercial on it as you move north. And, and we would agree that a proposal like this on North Lamar, north of Jefferson, should be considered carefully. But Jefferson itself has significant commercial uses on it, already has a hotel there and, and other significant commercial uses on it, and it's zoned for this use. Um, the question of loading. So right now we, we do have space in in the driveway before you go under the building for loading to occur for a van or small box truck, nothing bigger than that. Um, but that's all they anticipate needing. Um, and, and they would also work with their vendors to uh, coordinate hours, make sure they're not parking on the street. This is also a code enforcement issue as well, that they would not be able to park on the street anyway. Um, but, they, but they definitely intend to work with vendors to make sure that there's no loading uh, on, on either of the streets. Um, and then finally, the, the, this question of the Church of Christ parking lot, we really see this as a non-issue, and, and the reason is because this is the first we're ever hearing of this. <laughs> um, they've had no conversations with anyone at the church, and they do not intend to. We have public parking across the street, and that's the parking for the commercial and, and any overflow as far as they're concerned. So just wanted to touch on all those. If you have any other questions for me, I'm happy to answer. Otherwise, I'll sit down. I guess maybe some neighbors want to speak. Thanks, sir. Any questions for the app? Okay. I got a quick, oh, quick good. question. Uh, not necessarily for, for you, more of a city. Um, I mean, the, so the concern that people will not cross Jefferson because it's too busy. I don't, what, what are the, what's the process for having a crosswalk right there? At Jefferson and Lemon Street? I'm right, so to go from the parking garage to this yeah. site. That's something that can be looked at. Uh, it's not something that's been specifically requested, but we will look at that. Yes, sir. I think that would alleviate a lot of concerns about the full parking. Anyone else from the audience would like to speak? Yes, sir. Please come forward. Thank you. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Steve McDavid. I live on North 11th Street, five houses out from this project. I, my wife and I bought the house 30 years ago this year. And so we've seen it change a little bit. Let me give you just one second of history before we get into the facts. When we bought our house in 95, this property was zoned residential, okay? And in the 2000 rezoning, for some reason, without any requests by the property owners or the neighbors, it was rezoned commercial and added to the downtown commercial district. And also, three houses up North 11th were added to the downtown commercial district behind what was what is Oxford Floral. That was side was commercial at Oxford Floral. And three more lots were added to the downtown <coughs> commercial. So um, we're, uh, we're, we're addressing now the use of it. What happened in 2000 was instead of kicking out the purple iris, which was a commercial use, using the building as a re in, in a residential district, they just changed the zoning to comply with what was being used. So now we're here today having to fight over it. 
But before I get into mine, I'd love to ask one question. Do I understand the city, or they're going to be required to expand the width of the street just to the end of their property, and then it'll go back to 18 feet down the rest of? Or are they going to put 20 feet all the way down for the rest of us to have the fire truck? The work that they're doing is, is just on the length of their front Okay. All right. Um, so to, to get to what I'd like to talk about, if I could, um, I have some slides I want to kind of walk through my thoughts on this, and I appreciate your patience. Um, one thing I'd like to say, I appreciate Stuart talking about their intended use uh, being light commercial. I hope that that's where we can go. That's my first recommendation is that you all have the power to restrict it to a light commercial use. And I think that makes a lot of sense on lots that adjoin a residential district. And if you look all the way around the square in the downtown district, except for the graduate, there are no bars or restaurants adjoining the residential district. So now's the time to set a precedent and send a message to the mayor and the board to institutionalize what I hope y'all will do, and that is say, commercial is fine, it just needs to be light when it touches a residential. So, and by the way, the, the graduate, uh, there's been a bar there since the 50s when they built the Holiday Inn, so it's no surprise to anybody that bought on that street in the last 75 years. So, first thing I'd like to point out is, for those of y'all that were not here, in 1999 we did a, a rezoning and a visioning statement, and in the the statement that came out at the Vision 2020 statement, there are multiple places where the priority set by this comprehensive plan was protecting the residential districts. So the first two stated objectives in the overall plan were to protect the integrity and character of established neighborhoods, provide for quiet, convenient enjoyment of our neighborhoods. You go on down, the next group, curtail the expansion of the central business district was a priority. All right, so particularly into the residential areas, okay? And then when the plan addresses the North Lamar area, which is where this property is located, the North Lamar Residential Historical District, um, it says that it's not to be changed over to commercial. And we flip on down into the most recent um, rezoning. We have the Vision uh, 2037 plan. It reiterates these same proposals of the protection of the downtown historic neighborhoods. Now, on the second slide, um, this is the part of the code that really addresses the general purpose of the Planning Commission. And if you notice, the third one down is to implement the stated purposes, goals, and objectives of the comprehensive plan, the overall purpose for your commission. It's not simply to rubber stamp a site plan. Okay, so you look at the whole plan as you look at these site plans and to make recommendations to the mayor and the board. Next slide, if you would. If you go further into the code, uh, the very first section up there is the section 9210.1, but I've deleted the contents. That's the part of the code that says you need to review the, the water runoff and the very detailed specifics that are contained within the code. But the second provision under reviewing the site plan that says, in addition to such general considerations, you shall approve only after you consider the following factors. Now, I apologize a little bit for my color coding, but I wanted to emphasize that within those uh, discretionary uh, conditions that you're to look at, four different times they talk about traffic in the area and traffic as it affects the neighborhoods next to it. Four times they talk about parking and loading and how that affects the neighborhoods. Once they talk about um, noise, which is a little bit further down on this page. But five times in this area where you're given the discretion to create conditions and limits, it emphasizes the impact on neighborhoods that adjoin to the property. Uh, you know, the very first one at the top, which is now hidden, it says, the routing of vehicle traffic to and through minor residential streets is discouraged. North 11th, a minor residential street, so minor, they're having to widen it, okay? A little bit further down in G, they talk about when you look at the, oh, excuse me, up on C, it says you're supposed to look at the conditions, ownership, and the use in general. So you're directed to look and consider the use of the property in general as you set conditions. 
further down, it talks about parking, not to interfere with the surrounding property. And the further one, it says to prevent adverse effect in the environment or nearby property. So in other words, your powers go to creating limitations and conditions that protect the neighborhood next door. You have that power and it's right here. Now, uh, as Stuart said, the, the three things we're concerned about are trucks coming up down North 11th. If you're familiar with uh, Adams and Washington cutting back towards North Mar, a larger truck can't turn right. 15 feet wide, that's how wide they are. They need a 38 or larger circumference in order to take a right. So what does that mean? The trucks are gonna have to go down Sibley to Price Street, or they're gonna have to go to Washington Extended, take left and come back on 9th, through all of that residential area to deliver. Now, I appreciate them saying today they plan right now to be like commercial, but unless y'all put a restriction on them that prevents the heavy commercial traffic of a restaurant bar or a theater, then the next uh, owner or the next person could put in a restaurant and bar and wouldn't necessarily need to come back here for that purposes. So uh, I think it's important to think about that and think about what could happen should they change their mind. So first off, we've got traffic. Uh, I walk by the growler every morning on the way to work and every day at lunch and there's always an 18-wheeler out there unloading, either beer or food, every day of the week. A lot of times at lunch there's another truck out there. There's going to be trucks out there and they're not going to be able to park on Jefferson. So unless they're required to park across the street in the city parking lot, they're going to turn down North 11th. And once they turn down or come up North 11th, they're going to have to go through the city. They can't back out on Jefferson. They're going to keep going. So it's the biggest concern we have is the large trucks, without a doubt. Second one is two doors behind this is the Church of Christ parking lot. I think there's about 45 parking spaces there. On many busy weekends, it right now, which are most in Oxford, people that are going to the square are right now parking that park lot. There's just, it's very reasonable to assume that the employees of a restaurant and bar would park there and possibly patrons. And since they stay open until one in the morning, they'll come down the street, get in their cars and drive home, disturbing the neighborhood. I think it'll be a violation of zoning for them to do that because it's not allowed. But I think it's gonna happen if we don't do something specific to restrict it. And then uh, the third thing is noise generally. Uh, I live far enough down that I'm not worried about the noise, but a lot of my neighbors that live closer have signed this letter that I sent to y'all that uh, they're more concerned about the noise. Particularly, if you would turn to the fourth um, slide, this is a picture of a house that's three doors down behind uh, Oxford Floral. The one on the right there is in the downtown historic district. You can have a three-story bar right there. On the left is a family of four, okay? That's what I'd love for you to protect. Right now, the only thing in black and white in the code that protects those two zoning districts is a 15-foot setback, okay? Except for the powers that y'all have to look at the site plan and allow and impose some conditions, okay? If you go to five, if you turn around standing in the same spot directly across the street from that downtown Brown building, or two more historic, not historic, but two more, residences that are directly across the street from that downtown business, could be business, okay? And the parking lot, for information, those of y'all don't know, is to the right of that two-story building, Church of Christ parking lot. The house on the left of that picture is Mr. Jim Hendricks. If you go to the next slide, you'll see the other side of Mr. Hendricks' house, which adjoins this particular lot, okay? So, as you can see, the residential neighborhood is, is tucked right up against this two or three lots that are downtown commercial. Um, so my, uh, my request is that you, um, if you would slip one more slide there, I've kind of got several alternatives because it's always good to give people several ways to find for you. The very first one is the one I think you should do. And that is to approve the site plan as proposed, but limit the uses to light commercial, specifically prohibiting restaurant bars and theaters. I think that's what should occur. And I think you should recommend that to the board and the mayor as part of your powers to, to uh, have that as the rule 
on every commercial lot that attaches or adjoins a residential lot around the city. Okay. Obviously, the grant, it would be grandfather in the uh, graduate hotel, but everything else would have to be like commercial and protect the residences. If you're not willing to go that far, then I would say again, approve the site plan, but condition that if they have a restaurant bar that's required to be closed by 10 o'clock and that the loading must occur across the street and that the city at the Church of Christ parking lot has to, cannot be used. They have to inform their patrons and employees to not use it. So that's first is, I think, restrict the use to one that would be compatible and not damaging to the neighborhood. Okay. If you're not willing to restrict the use, then I throw out number two, and that's to require all, that's to, well, first off, is to deny the site plan. Okay. One way to cure this problem, almost, is to push the building to the back and have the parking in the front so that trucks and other traffic come in off Jefferson and leave off Jefferson. They don't come down North Lamar. Okay. So that would be, an, and the alternative, I'd say approve it, but conditioned upon the loading from the city parking lot across the street, and then the employees and patrons can't park in the Church of Christ parking lot. So I've got them in my list of priorities, but uh, I didn't want to go away empty handed if y'all had a different view on how this should work. Um, finally, my last slide is just a list of neighbors that have signed off on this letter uh, and uh, in agreement. So. Thank you, sir. Any questions for Mr. McDavid from the commission? I mean, I would. One thing that jumps out to me is the, the church parking lot. The church, the, can the church not just enforce? I mean, it's their parking lot, right? Can they not decide who gets to park there and who doesn't? Well, uh, yes and no. Uh, it's only allowed as a church parking lot in a residential district because it's a church parking lot. We had this fight years ago when they were about to sell the Church of Christ and the developer wanted to change the parking lot to a commercial parking lot to feed the commercial building he was going to make on that lot. And the city denied it because it's you can't have a commercial use inside a residential district. So it was only allowed because it was a church use. So to answer your question, they could. I don't know if they will. Uh, I don't know what I can do if they don't. I mean, if you're asking me to bring a lawsuit to enforce that. I guess that's what I'd have to do if nobody does anything. I mean, right now, uh, the Oxford, several Oxford floral employees park there. It's not a big deal because they're gone at 530. And if the other business employees were parking there and they went home at 530 and they were selling shoes or doing hair, it wouldn't be a big deal. It's one o'clock in the morning and you've got drunks and employees coming out and going home. That's the problem with the concern. No, I just meant the church parking lot. They just say, look, you can't park here until 6 p.m. I mean, just tell anybody that does. That'd be great. I, but I'm not the church. And I don't go there. All right. That's fine. Mm. <clears throat> Make sure that's straight. Okay. Other questions? I noticed that there are 28 signatures. How many homes are being affected or in that area? Well, on, on North 11th, before the truck would have to go left on Washington or left down civilly i can just real quickly i can tell you on our street we have about 11 that are past this commercial area now once you go down civilly there's probably i'm just guessing another 30 homes if you go down washington and back up ninth there's probably about 15 to 20 homes and how many of those sign how many of those people signed this oh, i'm sorry i didn't count up the number well, i see 28 names but how many of those are family Were there, was there <coughs> every family Yes, ma'am. These are only people on that, except for uh, Pat Tatum, who's on North Lamar and Washington, where they would be trying to turn that way. So all the rest of them are on North 11th or I think Sibley. I'm not sure we had any. And a couple in Washington. They're from that area. Oh, well, yeah, the Hardys uh, across, the, across the way. Okay. I asked that for them to put their address so that y'all know where they live. Gotcha. Thank you, sir. Uh, Commissioner Spragans or Milo, any questions for Mr. McDavid or for the applicant? Right. No. <clears throat> no. All right. I would like to say one other thing, just so you know it. I have appealed the ruling of the Historic Preservation Commission. Uh, the developer, as well as the planning department, uh, utilize downtown buildings 
to justify the look of the building. But this particular property, it's a strange piece of property. It's in the North Lamar Residential Historical District. It's not in the Downtown Historical District. Although it's in the Downtown District for zoning, for uses, it's not when it comes to the aesthetics. So I have appealed it, and that will go to the city uh, after this decision is made. Okay. I mean, I'll say that in terms of our ability to limit the uses, I mean, I think that gets into rezoning and just accepting your timeline that it was uh, residential before 95 and then it was rezoned in 2000. We're still looking at nearly 25 years that it's been zoned commercial. And I don't think I don't think we have the power, honestly, to limit the uses given what's in the land development code by right. Um, you know, Ben or Paul, feel free to weigh in on that. But with the Church of Christ parking, that I don't think that's a city issue personally. I think that the church is welcome to enter into a parking agreement or to allow free parking for whoever at their discretion and. I'm not saying there couldn't be a, a situation arise that the city would need to get involved, um, but otherwise, I don't. I don't see that as something that we can weigh in on either. And then um, the truck issue. I, I mean, I I definitely understand the issue with delivery trucks, especially the larger ones. Um, at this point, given the um, the intended use currently of of light commercial, I think it's premature to put a condition on it when. We don't know that there are big trucks coming to this establishment yet. So, I mean, I think that's something the city could look at if it turns into a problem for the neighborhood, for sure. Well, can, can we go back to slide three for a second, please? And will there be another opportunity for the city to address, uh, excuse me, for y'all to address it if they don't do light commercial? If for the becomes... site plan? I mean, I think that issue is independent of the site plan, honestly. I, I think that the neighborhood can raise it with the board at any point. Okay. Paul, does the city have the right to change or limit commercial traffic like on those streets when they can't city impose that at any time? Right? I, I assume that they could put a sign up that says no. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> that, that may be. Well, this is why I want to pull up slide three again. Uh, it seems like, JR, you don't feel like you have any of the powers that it seems like this provision is saying y'all should have. The ability to consider traffic flow, use in general is under C, parking, and the effect on the neighborhood. What does this mean if it doesn't mean you have that authority to create a condition or a limitation? I think that this says that in site plan review, all of these things have to be looked at. And I, I mean, as part of this, the uh, review that's been done. Well, and no. I don't think that, I mean, we're getting really, we, we have some powers, but uses are toward this central component of what zoning is. And so we, we put in the land development code what uses are allowed at this site. I don't think as a commission we have the power to come in and change what those uses are without rezoning the property. So uh, ex excluding or amending, the or amending the ordinance. So if you exclude uses, do you think you have power to uh, control traffic flow as in number A or the routing of traffic? Steve, just say like this, the planning commission has ample authority to place conditions on the approval of the site plan that have to do with the issues that have arisen from the site plan. For example, if an applicant has a stormwater plan and the calculations haven't been finalized, that's part of site plan review and it can be conditioned on the engineering department's final review and approval of those numbers because that's a part of the site plan review process. The intended uses of the property are not part of the site plan review process unless there is a conditional use or a special exception use that the 
planning commission is specifically being asked to and authorized to consider. So yes, they absolutely have that authority in those cases, but to limit the ability in the future of a property uh, to use a piece, a, a site plan, a building, or whatever, for a particular use that's otherwise allowed under the code, no, JR is exactly right. That's getting into rezoning. Okay, well, it says condition on ownership, control, and use generally. What does that mean in the statute? It does not mean that the planning commission can decide the use of a particular piece of property on a case-by-case -case basis. They don't do that. Okay, let's, just, let's set aside use for a second. What does traffic flow and parking and the five different places where it says as it affects the neighboring property mean? What rights and powers do they have there? We have, several, like we have several site plans on the agenda, and each one of those in the site plan review process, parking and traffic flow, I think that'll come up on one of the cases later on um, in terms of site distance. All of that is reviewed, and there, there are engineering requirements that have to be met. Sometimes there are different options in play, and the commission may have some power when it comes to choosing between options that we feel most benefit the public. But in general, we can't just say, you know, you need more parking. I mean, there, there's specified ranges that they have by right. Um, there are requirements for parking. There's a 25% overage that they're allowed to do by right. They, they can get a waiver within 10% of some of the rules just administratively. I mean, we have rules mostly so that we can't exhibit too much power in, in telling developers what they can and can't do on a whim. I understand those and those all seem like uh, uh, issues that exist on a particular piece of property as opposed to the adjoining neighborhood, which this provision says you have the power to address. Do you all ever address these provisions? We do, and I think in the right context, some of the points that you brought up could be, could be addressed. I don't think at the site plan it, it's appropriate at this time. In my opinion, there are other commissioners here. Yeah. So just so I'm clear, you feel like these provision in the code 9 does not give you the authority to do what I've asked you to do in my four different alternatives? I think in some cases, if we knew, for Until example, this, this, that this would be a, a very busy. We're not, not cross-examining the commission's statement. The ordinance says what it says, and the rest of the commissioners can look at it and decide what they want to do with it. And that's what they can do. They can make their decision. They understand and appreciate your position. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? I mean, my final comment <clears throat> is that, I mean, at the heart of what I think you're getting at is the concern about there being a lot of disturbance, I guess, is the way to say it. And I would say that <clears throat> I've been to the Isom House for a number of weddings. I don't think it's gonna be that disturbing. And that, that's, that, is a, that is a party that they hold right there, right next door, we're talking about. So <clears throat> anything short of that, I think it's, it's fair. As long as they comply, like it looks like that. Yeah. I'm not saying that, that the, the neighborhood shouldn't have recourse. I just think that based on what's on paper currently, there's no hardship on the neighborhood yet. Thank you, sir. Any other, any, anyone from the audience wish to speak on this case? Anyone online? All right, commissioners, is there a motion on case number 3051 for the site plan? I move that we grant the site plan review as requested with the five or four conditions, I guess since the one has been approved, so it'd be four conditions. All right, there's a motion to approve subject to the staff conditions. Is there a second? Second. There's a second. All in favor? All right. Commissioner Milam, how do you vote? Yes. And Commissioner Spragans, how do you vote? Yes. All right. So the site plan is approved. That brings us to case number 3066. Scott Vasiliev has filed a request for two parts, a special exception as provided in section 4.9.1.1.A, phased parking, and a second special exception as provided in section 2.6.7.1, 
traditional neighborhood business, 51% for property located at 108 Boulevard. Robert? Right. Uh, subject property is about two acres located in the MSL subdivision just south of the intersection of Bolt Boulevard and Clubhouse Drive. The applicant is proposing to construct a phased office development consisting of two buildings that are a uh, little over 6,000 and about 10,500 uh, square feet. Uh, the site plan is currently under review um, and the special exception requests are to facilitate that site plan. Uh, so for the first one, you have a special exception uh, for phase parking. Uh, the applicant requests a special exception for phase parking plan to provide in excess of the maximum allowed parking. Uh, the building proposed with phase one is uh, 6,375 square feet. And as an office use would require 21 spaces and allow up to 27. Uh, the building proposed in phase two is uh, 10,500 uh, square feet and would require 35 and up to 44. The applicant proposes to build 57 spaces, uh, which is more than the maximum for just phase one uh, and less than the uh, combined allowed for both phases. Um, applicant states that building both phases of parking uh, will allow for proper fire access as well as environmental services while also reducing construction costs. Uh, staff doesn't have any objections to the request a special exception and recommend approval with the uh, one condition. Um, for the second request, uh, for a second story, uh, waiver essentially, uh, the applicant is requesting a special exception for structure height uh, from the requirement that at least 51% of the ground floor area should be encompassed in functional second floor space. The applicant's proposing that the first floor will include an office space uh, over 35% of the floor and the remainder will be storage for equipment. Uh, the second story will be document storage over the office space. Uh, the ground floor storage component will have the volume of a second story due to the need for an elevated ceiling uh, to accommodate the size of some of the equipment that is being stored there. And the whole building will present uh, as having two full floors for the height uh, of the ground floor storage being roughly 17 and a half feet. And given that the ground floor storage uh, element provides a functional second story volume, uh, staff recommends approval of the requested special exception with the one condition that is listed. Thank you, sir. Questions for Robert or for the applicant? Um, so just to restate it on the second special exception, 35% of the second story will be a standard second story, and Correct. then the rest will be two stories tall, but just basically a tall first story. Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, is there anyone from the audience that would like to speak on this? If not, uh, anyone online that would like to speak? Commissioners? All right, is there a motion from the commission on the special exception for phased parking? I'd move that we grant the special exception. All right, motion to approve with the staff condition? With the staff condition. With staff condition, is there a second? Second. There is a second. All in favor? All right, Commissioner Milam, how do you vote? Yes. And Commissioner Spragans? Yes. And so the first special exception is granted. The second special exception for the second story, is there a motion? I make a motion to approve the special exception for the second story uh, with the one staff condition. There's a motion to approve subject to the staff condition. Is there a second? Second. There's a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Commissioner Milam? Yes. And Commissioner Spragans. Yes. All right, so both special exceptions are approved. That brings us to case number 3067, Russell Construction has filed a request for a site plan approval for Seoul for property located at Old Taylor Road. Okay. Okay, so this property is located on Old Taylor Road just before the Old Taylor Road and Oxford Way intersection. Um, the property is on suburban multifamily and the applicant is proposing 28 one-bedroom units and 14 two-story buildings. Um, this use is allowed in the suburban multifamily district um, and the proposal also meets the parking requirements with 37 parking spots provided 
Um, two of those are handicap accessible. The landscaping plan provided um, indicates the necessary frontage trees, edge plantings, parking lot trees, and um, detention pond screening. Um, and the proposed building materials and building height meet the requirements of the land development code. Um, a complete streets plan was provided showing sidewalks along the street frontage and within the development, uh, which will be accessed from Old Taylor Road. The engineering department provided comments regarding access, um, water and sewer, and stormwater management, and staff is recommending approval of the site plan with five uh, conditions from planning and engineering. Thank you. Questions from the commission? I have a couple. Um, John, on the, there were two things that I had a question about. Um, one was the, it, it was mentioned that the city's requested a <coughs> stormwater drainage easement. What's the status on that easement? Um, I'll let Joey speak okay. Thanks, Joey. <clears throat> Joy Moore, Jam Engineering. Um, we spoke to Mr. Albritton last <laughs> week and he was fine with it. We're just working through the paperwork okay. right now. That's great. And then the other issue was the placement of the entrance and exit. Um, it, it sounded like there was some discussion about where to put it. I mean, I don't know many details besides what's in the, the case report. Was there any thought about just flip-flopping where the entrance is? Sure. I sent an updated, I looked at that and sent it to John this morning. As, as you flip-flop it, you get closer to the hill, but it doesn't clear it. So you're actually creating a worse situation because now you shorten that distance that you can't see. You know, the, in this situation, the best thing to do is to keep it as far away from the hill, which would be to the north as possible, mm -hmm. uh, in my opinion. Now, you know, I suggested lowering the speed limit there because that hill right there is dangerous in the fact that you have Oxford Way on the other side of the hill mm -hmm. and that sight distance doesn't meet either. And there's a lot of people all those apartment complexes coming back on the Old Taylor Road. So that was my suggestion. Um, if the city doesn't want to lower the speed limit of Old Taylor Road, at least in that section, then I would say keep it to where we have it as far away from that hill and give as much distance to see coming out of the development as possible. So the problem is that the property is sandwiched between a curve and a hill? Well, there's just a, there's that hill where the existing gas station is on Old right. Taylor Road. Right. And so we are north of that hill, but we're not far enough away from that hill to okay. where you can see over the top of it. It's just the it. hill. Okay. Yeah. Um, John, is that going to work? Or? Yeah, so every driveway on Old Taylor Road down through there doesn't technically meet the site distance requirements. Normally, what we do in a situation like this is that signage where you have signs either upstream or downstream of the property, usually it's associated with flashing lights saying drive over Eagle Falls or watch for a turn of traffic and things like that. The, the lowering of the speed limit is something that required board approval based upon a traffic study. Mm -hmm. um, with the way people drive on Old Taylor Road, it's not likely that a traffic study would reveal that we could lower the speed limit to 25, but we are conducting that speed study right now just to be thorough. Okay. Any other questions? Commissioner Milam, Commissioner Spragans, any questions? No, no. Look up here. No. The stormwater retention. It didn't look like there's much on that. Where is engineering? Have you guys looked at anything as far as what they're going to do specifically on that? So it, it looks like they're doing a the pond on the northwest corner of the site. Joe, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but you know, aside from you know, if there are any issues getting the easement, we wouldn't anticipate those issues getting it approved. I guess that's my primary question. Is this fully dependent on getting that easement? Uh, well, that my understanding, yeah. Approval, yeah. Yeah, that's my understanding. So get that, but there's no, yeah, that's that's right. Yeah. Okay. So if, if the adjoining property didn't want to give you an easement, is there any prospect for discharging on, on this property? I, you know, in my honest opinion, that pipe is there. That pond is there. I, I do find it kind of hard to believe that I need an easement for an existing pipe. Now we're gonna get one because the property owner doesn't have a problem with us getting one. But I've had that question is that we've got this pipe that's leaving the property yeah. that's there now. What do you know, what do you do in that instance? Because the gas station is using that pipe. So that's there. So it's like we would be our site would be undevelopable if that adjoining owner wouldn't be able to give us that easement for an existing yeah. pipe. 
I understand. I mean, it's just that the, the code says explicitly yeah. you're going to discharge. Sure. Your so, sure. I understand. How big is the pipe? I think it's an 18, 1824, something like that. I think it's 18. Okay. In other words, it can handle the yes. slide from that? Yeah. We've turned everything in. We've got comments back from engineering last week or maybe the, in, the, in the week before about some revisions to stormwater plan, but we're working through it like we do on every project. So we're, we're there. I mean, we're close. We just have to finish up the minor stuff. Okay. Anyone from the audience have any comments or questions? Anyone online? If not, is there a motion on the case of this? Case number 3067 for the site plan. I'd move that we grant the site plan approval with five staff conditions. All right, we have a motion for approval, subject to staff conditions. Is there a second? Second. A second, all in favor? Aye. Right. Commissioner Milam? Yes. And Commissioner Spragans? Yes. All right. Thank Same you. Plan is approved. Thank you, sir. Our next case is case number 3068. Oxford Farms has filed a request for site plan approval for the reserve phase two property located at 1811 Reserve Loop. Robert. Okay. Um, subject property is a little under 50 acres located on Oxford Farm Drive, uh, north of the roundabout on Oxford Way between the reserve phase one and the Stillwater development. Uh, the applicant is proposing the second phase to the reserve, which would consist of 140 attached and 75 detached units of a similar style to the reserve phase one. The entire development is proposed as an RCID, which is a special use in the, in the district, uh, and attached residential is a special use in NR uh, when proposed with fewer than 25 four-bedroom units. Uh, only 12.8% uh, of attached units are proposed to be four bedroom. Uh, detached units of four or more bedrooms are special exceptions in the NR and a special exception request has been received and would need to be approved by the Planning Commission before uh, permits could be issued for these uh, units. Uh, parking calculations uh, are uh, noted. Uh, they are uh, in compliance. Um, for landscaping, a uh, landscaping uh, package is included that shows foundation plantings, parking lot trees, and perimeter landscaping that meet the LDC uh, requirements, and a sufficient buffer from the Blue Line stream is maintained to fully screen uh, the stream. Uh, tree mitigation is considered together with the northern portion of the reserve phase one. Uh, sufficient trees are retained on the north and east of the site. Uh, that mitigation is not required at this time. Uh, should those trees be removed in the future, mitigation may become necessary. Uh, building architecture uh, will be very similar to other phases of the farms. Uh, the detached and attached residential structures as well as the pool house will be very similar to the still water development. Uh, exterior materials will be a combination of hardy plank siding and painted brick veneer with asphalt shingle roofing. And as always with sign edge, a separate approval will be uh, required to ensure compliance with the sign requirements. Uh, engineering had comments uh, related to access sidewalk and streets, water and sewer and stormwater and staff recommends uh, approval of the requested site plan for the reserve phase two with the five conditions that are noted in the staff report. Thank you, sir. Questions? Any questions? All right. Anyone from the audience that would like to speak on this case? <coughs> All right, if not, I'll entertain a motion on case number 3068 for the site plan at the reserve at Oxford Farms. I'd move that we grant the site plan approval for the reserve phase two with the five conditions as stipulated by staff. There's a motion to approve, subject to the staff conditions. Is there a second? Second. There is a second. All in favor? Commissioner Milo, how do you vote? Uh, yes. And Commissioner Spragans? Yes. All right. Site plan is approved. 
Our next case is case number 3069, JWM Development LLC has filed a request for a final plat approval for Colonnade Crossing Phase 3, property located at 1669 Bainbridge Street. Okay. Okay, so this property is located uh, north of Highway 30 and west of Highway 7. The plat includes one lot, which is lot 12, um, and an area for public right-of-way dedication. Um, the applicant proposes to construct six multifamily buildings on the site, the site plan for which we would hear after this um, case. Um, the proposed lot meets the dimensional requirements of the underlying SCO zoning. Engineering provided comment on um, sidewalk and streets and water and sewer, and staff is recommending approval of the plat with four conditions. I mean, I saw the developer here and his engineer, if anyone has questions for them. Thank you. Questions on the plat? None? Anyone from the audience or online? Is there a motion on case number 3069 for the final plat? I make a motion that we approve with the four staff conditions. There's a motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. Commissioner Spragans. All right. Uh, all in favor? And Commissioner Milam, how do you vote? Yes. All right. Our next case is case number 3070. KQ Oxford LLC has filed a request for site plan approval for the Edison property located at 814 Claremont Avenue. So um, the lot size is the same um, property. The lot size is about 14.16 acres and the proposed right-of-way dedication is about 4.77 acres. Um, the lot has frontage on what will be Claremont Avenue and Ferndale, Ferndale Boulevard, which will be pub public roads. Um, the plan calls for six multifamily buildings. Additional buildings include a clubhouse and an outdoor common area. Um, the multifamily buildings will have two different uh, footprints labeled in your plans as type A and type B. Um, and then the uh, clubhouse will hold both the rental offices and a gym. Uh, for the proposed development, 448 spaces are required. The applicant proposes 429 parking spaces, 11 of which are ADA compliant, um, and six of which are equipped for electric vehicle charging. Um, the parking is both uncovered and spread through five covered garages that you'll see on the site plan. Um, and the applicant will need a waiver for that reduction and provided parking, which has already been um, turned in to the planning department. Um, in terms of coverage, height, and setbacks, the um, property uh, proposes, sorry, the applicant proposes 48.1% when they are allowed to have up to 80% lot coverage in the SCO. Uh, they also meet the requirements for building height and uh, front, side, and rear setbacks. A landscaping plan was included that meets the requirements of the Land Development Code for foundation plannings, edge plannings, uh, street, uh, street and parking lot trees, and screening. And the architecture and building materials meet the requirements of the code. Engineering provided comment on um, access, grading, and drainage, water and sewer, and stormwater and staff is recommending approval of the site plan with um, seven listed conditions from both planning and engineering. Thank you, Kate. Questions from the commission? I think since one of the conditions is a waiver obtained from the director of planning and the waiver hasn't been granted yet, that there's an opening for discussion there. Is the applicant present? Um, so, sorry. Good afternoon, John Granberry with Granberry and Associates, for the record. Thank you, sir. Um, it says that by code 448 spaces are required but y'all are proposing 429 could you just walk us through the logic sure um, so uh in the land development code um section 
2.2 uh, allows for a parking reduction request <coughs> and uh, gives that um, ability to grant that request to uh, the planning director. Um, we provided uh, data from our previous developments that the uh, the developer has and are gone in several states where they've got a certain parking ratio that they know that they need to meet and that they anything more is just a waste and that is one um, one instance of why and the reasoning why they wanted the reduction the other um, we referred directly to the um, ITE parking generation manual um, the fifth edition um, where and I've got I submitted this letter and everything to um, the planning department, but but basically in a multifamily developments around the country, uh, the parking generation manual and similar multifamily developments with um, mid-rise, basically less than five story, um, when you have a certain proximity close to a rail system or not close to a rail system. Of course, we're not close to a rail system. I looked at. Um, the fact that we're not close to public transit, even though we do have a public transit, but I wanted the um, most conservative estimate that the ITE uh, parking generation manual will provide. Um, and it, it basically goes off of two metrics that, that govern your parking requirement. One would be by the bedroom, uh, the other would be uh, by the dwelling unit. Um, by the, the dwelling unit, um, you have a 1.7 uh, ratio um, of, and this is you know taking average of several uh, sites all over the country, but a 1.7 uh, parking space per dwelling unit, uh, and then by the bedroom, you just, there's a one. It's an average on one uh, parking space per bedroom. Um, when you look at both of those numbers, what you end up coming up with um, for our site, you end up with a 408 spaces um, at 1.7 uh, space per dwelling unit. Uh, we have 240 dwelling units. Um, and then at a bedroom, um, we have 372 bedrooms. At one space per bedroom, it's 372 parking spaces. Of course, the most stringent of those, the most conservative, would be the 408 parking spaces. And um, we're providing for uh, 29 spaces. Um, so we feel like, um, in accordance with the international you know, traffic engineering guidelines, we, we, we meet the requirement. For sufficient parking. Okay, I mean it's not a it's not a big difference. It's like about five percent from the um, from the the code requirement. Ben, do you see any obvious adverse consequences? No, I think there's still a handful of guest parking available. Given what John's explained, it from a, a one one side and from the bedroom standpoint, there's still adequate uh, guest parking there. Chiefly. Uh, Maybe one thing that the ITE manual doesn't necessarily take into consideration is being in a college town where you do have, um, you know, more guests in our apartment complexes than uh, maybe a traditional apartment complex. Um, but you know, the way I see it is there was ample uh, guest parking available. Okay. Are there other questions? <clears throat> Anyone from the audience or online? All right. If not, is there a motion on case number 30704 site plan for the Edison? I make a motion that we approve um, with the following six since we already approved the um, final plat previously. <coughs> right. Go ahead, Max. Is there stormwater? I was trying to read through the recommendations real quick and see if there's a stormwater. It's a regional stormwater detention facility for that development right. um, that covers, and we're we're well under our impervious area allowable. The two ponds that we do have are for aesthetic purposes. Now we do provide some attenuation, uh, mainly just to maintain our normal pool, um, so it does assist in the overall stormwater detention. While it's not really required, but we do uh, add some attenuation to the overall development. <clears throat> okay. I was, I was, I guess, concerned, well, not concerned, but looking at there was, I think, an agreement that you had to, had to be reached with an adjacent property owner? Yes, that's the, also the developer, okay. yeah. Okay. Would you say we're minimal. on the plat, we, yeah, we, yeah, <laughs> it has. Okay. Uh, there's a motion to approve subject to staff conditions. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? 
Commissioner Milam. Yes. Commissioner Spragans. Yes. All right. Site plans approved. Thanks, Thank sir. you all. That brings us to case number 3071, SMJ Enterprises LLC has filed a request for site plan approval for Bella Vita for property located at Harlan Drive. Robert? When do you enter public comment after he presents? Yes, ma'am. He'll present and then the commission will ask a few questions and then we'll invite folks from the audience to speak. Uh, well, subject property is 12.37 acres located between Harlan and Oxford, Oxford Farms. Applicant is proposing a residential development of 30 attached and 31 detached units to be named Bella Vita. Uh, the entire development is proposed as an RCID, which is a special use in the NR district. Uh, attached residential is a special use in the NR when proposed with fewer than 25% four bedrooms. Uh, all attached units are proposed as three bedrooms. Detached units of four or more bedrooms are special exceptions, and the special exception request was denied um, and was upheld at the Mayor Board of Aldermen, so that will be a change that is going to be needed. Um, and I don't think we have that as a condition. Um, uh, parking calculations uh, are included and they meet uh, adequate parking even if they were to uh, change to three bedroom units for the uh, uh, detached units. Um, for access, two points of access are provided to the site and main entrance uh, and exit uh, south through the Oxford Farms development to Oxford Way and a one-way entrance uh, to the north from Harlan Drive. Uh, for landscaping, uh, packages included that shows the uh, foundation plantings, parking lot trees, and perimeter landscaping that meet LDC requirements. Uh, per the variance issued to encroach on the 50 foot uh, blue line stream buffer, uh, under canopy plantings will be required in addition to the proposed trees between the drive and the creek. Um, tree survey was conducted for the site that in, uh, indicates that uh, 373 two inch caliper trees will be required for mitigation. Uh, 202 trees are marked on the landscape plan for mitigation, while the other 171 uh, will be paid into the tree escrow account. Um, building architecture will be similar to other new residential developments in Oxford. Uh, exterior materials will be a combination of fiber cement siding and brick veneer with asphalt shingle roofing and uh, signage is a separate approval. Uh, engineering has uh, comments related to access, traffic, sidewalks, and streets, grading, drainage, and flood risk information, water and sewer, and stormwater. Uh, of note with the water and sewer, uh, there was an issue that was brought up uh, with some letters of objection about uh, sewer. Uh, is my understanding that a solution has been worked out on that? That's correct. Okay. Um, and so staff recommends approval of the requested site plan for Bella Vita with the uh, six uh, conditions. If y'all could add a seventh uh, to have the uh, four bedroom units that are shown uh, be three bedroom units uh, for the uh, detached units. Say that again, please. Uh, approval is contingent on uh, modification of the site plan uh, to indicate three bedroom detached units uh, per the denial of uh, gotcha. yeah, case number 3058. Thank you, Robert. Yep. Commissioners, questions for staff or for the applicant? I know, I think at the last meeting, I'm not sure if it was the last meeting or meeting before last, you had discussed the possibility of getting FEMA funds for that box culvert. Am I right on that? Well, if the box culvert in Harlem, yes, I'm hard. we would apply for a grant to replace that box culvert to upsize it where it will convey the property to your store, whereas now it's not. Um, so, FEMA has not granted that application yet. It's still in Atlanta somewhere, but we have done so. But you have what? We have applied for it. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, but they, they have not given us the funds for that project. Okay. And one of the recommendations had to do with that, I believe, did it not? One of the conditions? On the, on the box culvert? Well, there's a, there's a second ball, box culvert. That's they're, a, they're building the box yeah. culvert. But, but that is, that's not, I think, the one we're talking about. 
That's okay. for the second ingress egress. Okay. Yep. Um, I have a question for the applicant. It, Paul or Stuart? It's going to be engineering. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to let Stuart try, but. You know. Hey, I'm Paul Cascianino, <laughs> Precision Engineering here representing the applicant, SMJ Enterprise. Uh, thanks, Paul. Um, my questions are about the, the stormwater, and specifically, since this is a, a low site, um, it looked like from the, the site plan that that ingress, egress off Harlan was going to be right around 380 feet elevation, and we already know that that area goes underwater. Right. And that same elevation propagates through to the parking area for some of the buildings on the site. And the stormwater detention at the southern end of the site is pretty much all below 380 feet. So if 300 feet, 380 feet is going to flood and the stormwater is going to be overtopped, it's hard for me to see how it's going to comply with the ordinance in that case. since. Once it's over top, nothing nothing new is being detained from what falls on the site. Right. Well, and, and John may be able to help speak to this as well. But um, you know, uh, the interpretation that we understand from the city engineering department on uh, properties that are located within the regulatory floodway or flood zone. This is this property has regulatory floodway and floodplain. Uh, but for for projects that are located in those areas. Uh, as long as we meet the requirements for the volume of the stormwater detention system, uh, even if it is located below the 100-year uh, flood elevation, um, that's my understanding is that's considered compliant. Um, and, but you're right. If, if, uh, if there's a 100-year flood, theoretically, and it reaches elevation that the current flood map show, I mean, that system would be submerged. Mm -hmm. uh, now, but to that point, and I think this is maybe something that was mentioned in the, um, the staff report, or in the case report, uh, there are maps that are being reviewed, I think, now with the city. I don't know if they've been put out for uh, public review yet, but uh, updated FEMA maps or flood insurance rate maps those actually show that flood elevation potentially going up from what the current maps show. We've designed our site uh, in compliance with the, uh, the proposed maps, even those those have not been adopted. Uh, all of the structures on our site would be elevated above that, uh, that future flood elevation. Uh, so. That, that's our intent there is we're trying to be proactive with that we don't want our our client or uh, future uh, homeowners out there to retroactively be required to have flood insurance when some new maps come out that, that are different than what is uh, readily available now so okay do you have a question yeah <clears throat> so you said you're going to build above <clears throat> that 100 year flood excuse me <clears throat> 100 year flood level what's the how much how much above that I think all of our homes are proposed to be uh, at a minimum 18 inches, 18 inches above the base flood elevation or the 100 year flood elevation. So, okay, above the 100 year. Right. <clears throat> and that's according to the maps that have not been adopted, but they show that flood elevation actually being higher than the maps that are in place now. So we're complying with the yet to be adopted maps. <clears throat> Has engineering looked at like the impact as far as this development, so drop it down where it's going to go? And we're going to get it off site, and we're okay with the site. But does the, the ditch that it's about to go into is it going to be able to handle that? I know we're building a lot in that area, and those ditches are not our passing area; they're not very big. But have you guys any calculations on that? We, we've not done sort of what we're here calling like a system wide uh, assessment, which, which may be something we need to do. You know, as as development and something uh, uh, keeps rocking down there. Um, but site specific, we, we've not you know, done a capacity calculation on it. The stormwater management simply takes the water that's generated from that site and makes sure that the runoff does not increase. Um, as far as the flood damage prevention ordinance goes, um, you know, we allow development within a floodplain as long as they don't encroach in the floodway. As long as they what I didn't get you dropping your words at the end of the sentences, so please just a little bit louder. Yes, ma'am. The the flood damage prevention ordinance does allow them to build within the 100 year floodplain, but not in the regulatory floodway. So the regulatory floodway is is theoretically 
what is put there to to maintain that base flood. In other words, when when the engineering firm that creates those maps, uh, they squeeze in the floodplain until that BFE raises one foot and then they stop. And then they set the limits of that floodway right there saying, okay, beyond this limit, we're not gonna allow any encroachments, whether it's fuel, parking, or anything like that. So that's how a floodway is sort of delineated from a floodplain. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that there will not be effects from filling in all the floodplains. There may very well be. Um, that, that's just something we're gonna have to address with future ordinances. At, at what point do we do capacity calculations on all of our train stations to start setting maybe further restrictions in these floodplain areas? But as of right now, there, there's no real restriction um, you know, on building the floodplain unless we can show a, a real life safety issue. Right, and, and so that the regulatory floodway that is the um, the portion of the drainage base or the drainage way that is uh, needed to convey the, the 100 year flood, we're not encroaching into the floodway. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're complying with those code requirements. Uh, do, do and, we, in the area that we are building, we're elevating above the 100 year flood. Do, do either of you know, I mean, the, the FEMA maps are based on the 100 year flood, but I'm not going to say that the FEMA maps might be wrong, but it, it looks like Harlan Drive at its lowest point is right about 380, and we know that it overtops more frequently than once every 100 years, mm -hmm. right? And so do we have any idea what, uh, what interval we're looking at hitting 380 feet, if that's a 25-year flood or 30-year flood? I, I don't know the answer to that. Okay. I mean, I, I think that the overtopping of Harlan, I think, is because the box culvert is undersized. Yeah. And, and the city is pursuing funds to try to replace that. JR, that's a number we can come up with by looking at the computer programs and, and running those yeah. numbers, but I don't know that off the top of my head right now. Yeah, I mean, the reason I ask is just, you know, if we're going to, if we're going to judge the stormwater plan based on the amount of detention that's there and not the actual discharge that, that it's regulating, it matters to me what flood intervals we're actually talking about. If it's just the hundred year flood that we're, we're gonna bypass the detention system, or if it's the 25 year flood. Um, yeah, but it doesn't sound like we have those numbers yet. Are there other questions? Well, I, I have one more comment. This whole area is yes, ma'am, if you would just come forward and state your name for the record. Thank you, ma'am. This entire area at the bottom of Harlan Hill Could, I'm sorry. is the lowest point in Lafayette County. There are no more lower points, and so it's just a catch-all for water from all the way up at the top, all the way down to the bottom, <laughs> and in a heavy rain, you cannot walk over there, and I know they say they're going to build it up, but believe me, in all my years of living up there for 42, 45 years now, I've walked that fence line twice because this section of land has been on the market for quite a while. And if it had been, excuse me, worth buying, I would have bought it multiple times. But it's, it's, a, it's a swamp land and it's a beautiful piece of land all kinds of wild animals. One of the neighbors tried to get through the Mississippi legislature, legislature to turn this into a wildlife refuge, but another neighbor blocked it because he didn't like the idea. He was too close to it, he thought. But that is, it just shouldn't be developed, like I said. Yes, the lowest point in the county, there's always water there. They want to say they're going to build it up. I don't know how many inches, but how can you build up something where the creek comes out of its banks periodically, and not always, but periodically it comes out of its banks. And so I know from all the berms, if you come up my Harlan Hill, I have blocks everywhere. I have berms everywhere, but you still can't control all that water that's coming down on moss. Just, it just, well, you know, we have torrential downpours, and it's going to be undercut. 
Yes, ma'am. Could you just state your name for the record, please? Donna Blevins at 1009 Harlan Drive. Thank you, ma'am. Any... And I've lived there for over, well, I don't know, a long time, over 40 years. I understand. Any and questions? One other thing, the lowest yes. point in the county, it's always been that, may not be that today, but I don't think the lowest point alters. I don't know what the topography is. I don't know, but it used to be the lowest point in the county and no one would ever build down there. I'm getting angry even now thinking about it. So anyway, I've said it. Thank you, ma'am. Other questions from the commission? Is there anyone else from the audience that would like to speak on this case? Anyone online? All right. Is there a motion on case number 3071 for the site plan? Yes. Yes, because it was, yep. Well, the report acknowledges it. The report acknowledges that the, um, that it was going to be appeal at that time, but then that was decided upon last week. And so, uh, and they upheld the planning commission's denial of the four bedroom special exemption request. So, uh, those four plans would have to be modified to not have Right. And just to be clear, the, the number of units on the site would stay the same. Right. Just the ones that were proposed to be four bedrooms would be three bedrooms. Three bedrooms. That's right. And, and we would uh, modify the floor plans to reflect that. Okay. Um, one other thing I was going to ask earlier, Mr. Crawley, uh, there was an email that uh, talked about the, the city's going to build a new sewer line. Is that right? Yes, sir. So uh, currently there exists a, a sewer line that runs through the north part of the site, I think that collects sewer from three or four of the lots up on Harlan Drive. Um, the developer is proposing to intercept that sewer and run it in a new sewer main to the south and through the development. Uh, it will be a public sewer, so it will not, they will not be relying on a private HOA to maintain their sewer system. It will be publicly owned. Okay, but the city, the city's not building a new sewer line. No, it, it, the developer will be responsible. Right, our, our client would construct that as part of the development, and then it would become the city's for ownership and maintenance. All right, any other questions or comments? I think I would like, I was just checking the conditions to see if there was a condition on the stormwater. There often is, I don't see one in this case, but since this stormwater plan hasn't been approved yet, I think I'd like to add that condition and just, personally, I'd like to go back and revisit whether it meets the stormwater code or not. I was going to say, I've actually got to go to, <clears throat> for the comment on that. I, mean, okay. I uh, was super hesitant to, to move forward this project because of so many questions. And one, <clears throat> once you build it, once we approve it, once it's there, and then we find out that, oh man, the water's higher than we thought it was. Oh, what do we do? I, I just, I, it seems like we're jumping the gun before we got all the answers and tell me. Not. Sure. No, no I, I don't think we are. I mean, we're, so the plan that we have is complying with the requirements from uh, the Federal Mer Emergency Management Agency, FEMA. Also complying with the City of Oxford's Land Development Code for stormwater design. Uh, I mean, I'm, uh, if JR would like to add the condition that we verify that the uh, system that we've designed meets the, the city's uh, ordinance requirements. I'm happy to do that, but. Uh, Again, I, I feel like we've gone really above and beyond. I mean, this, this property is in a flood zone. Uh, we're, we're not only complying with the maps that are currently uh, the guidelines that we have to go by, we are going above and beyond that to comply with maps that have yet to be adopted, which is actually costing the project more money. We're having to elevate the site higher than what we would under the current maps that are in place. So, uh, I mean, this is, um, uh, there are other projects in Oxford that have been built in, under certain similar circumstances. Uh, Hooper Hollow is one. I mean, that, that property was entirely within the regulatory flood zone, and uh, we, we, we were the engineer on that project. It is, um, 
Uh, it's performed as intended, and we, uh, just as this project, we complied with all of the, the federal requirements as well as the local requirements. John, I mean, is the city pretty confident that they know exactly what that level, that the water level is? I mean, I'm, I'm sure you're complying. That's not really my concern. My concern is that maybe our, maybe our uh, the rules in place are not, not up to date with all the development that's happened there. Do we really know what the water level is? And if the city well, thinks I, that they know so, so these maps that are currently under review from FEMA, I think those are being adopted because they say that the current maps maybe are in error. And that's why we're designing around the new maps that are being corrected. Yeah, so the maps that you're referring to are, are the city of Oxford is currently being remapped. And those maps have not been issued for public review or comment. But probably in the next next year or so, you will see that. And the, the elevations in those maps do do raise those foot elevations by, by about two feet from what they are right now. So that's, that's why we brought Paul in when this project first came about, to let him know of that so they could design around those increased elevations. You know, um, but to answer your question, do we know exactly, you know, where, how high that water is going to come up? Uh, I don't know that I can tell you an answer to that, um, other than theoretical that a computer would generate. If you came out to Harlan Hill, Harlan Drive, and you stood at the top and you watched all that water, it's almost like a waterfall. Now that doesn't happen every day or every month, but when it does, it's a sight to behold. It meets the creek, okay? The creek's out of its banks down there, and all of our water just goes down. It meets the creek, the water that's out of its banks. It doesn't go anywhere. It's just, it's a holding pattern or a holding plane, whatever you want to call it. It's like a catch-all for all the water in the county, I promise you. So, but I have some pictures of it, but I didn't, it didn't occur to me to bring it. Thank you, ma'am. Any other questions for, for Paul? Anyone else from the audience wish to speak? In our, our standard uh, condition for uh, stormwater is stormwater management facility will need to be certified before the issuance of certificate of occupancy. Okay. Does that work? That works. Okay. All right. If there are no Second. other. Second. I'm sorry? There are eight conditions currently proposed. Uh, is there a motion on the site plan? I make a motion to approve the site plan with the six printed staff conditions and the two additional conditions. Okay, there's a motion to approve subject to the eight total conditions. Is there a second? Second. Second, Commissioner Logan. And all in favor of approval? All opposed, Commissioner Milam. So what did you just decide? We haven't yet. One second, Commissioner Milam. How do you vote? Is he still with us? Commissioner Spragans, how do you vote? Yes. All right. Commissioner Milam, could you just repeat your vote, please? Yes. Thank you, sir. All right, the site plan is recommended for approval. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Yes, ma'am. That brings us to case number 3073. The city of Oxford has filed a request for there are two parts. First is a variance from the front yard build to minimum standards in section 2.6.15 institutional districts. And the second part is a variance from the retaining wall height standards in section 3.2.18 retaining walls for Oxford City Pool property located at 220 Washington Avenue. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, before you this evening is a request from the city uh, regarding the redevelopment of the current city pool. Um, and there have uh, been many discussions that have been had uh, with the city, uh, the city, uh, the mayor and board of aldermen um, over the past, you know, many months now about the pool, actually probably the past couple of years now. 
um, uh, for, you know, for the purposes of what to do with the pool. We need a, we need a new pool, it needs to be redeveloped, and so um, uh, the city has been working to come up with some sort of a plan that would address this. Uh, the plan uh, as it stands now is to use the existing pool facility uh, the pool the pool itself we're going to uh, rework it so the footprint of the pool will be in the exact same location however uh, some of the amenities will be um, uh, there'll be a new building that will be added and uh, and as such that's the nature of uh, one of your requests actually both of the requests that are before you right now number one uh, the building itself will be located closer to the street than the uh, the bill to line uh, minimum currently allows for. The minimum in the zoning district would allow for uh, the building to be 20 feet from the street or from the property line. Um, however, given that the city's choosing to use the existing pool footprint, um, it's pushing the building closer to the street to allow for more. Uh, of a pool deck and maneuverability uh, between the building and the pool itself. So uh, the request for the variance for the build to line is that the building be uh, at its closest 11 feet, 11.2 feet from the property line, which would suggest that we are requesting an eight foot, eight, uh, an 8.8 .8 foot variance from the build to line. And so the hardship in this instance is the fact that we're, uh, we're using the existing facility. It's not new construction, so we're kind of working with the, uh, uh, you know, with what we have here and, um, you know, to be able to achieve the, the desired effect for, um, you know, maneuverability between the existing facility and the pool. Uh, I'm sorry, between the new, new proposed building and the existing pool facility, I think that's, uh, that's the hardship in and of itself. Any questions on that questions. before I move on? Okay, so the other part is the fact that the property slopes, um, you know, from the street and it goes away from the property. And uh, that being said, as, um, and, and Paul Cushing can come speak to the, uh, the specific elevations, but um, they're actually going to cut down um, the site, I, I guess, a, a little bit more, and as such, there's a need for a retaining wall to hold up the uh, existing sidewalk. Um, and there has been some discussion as to what elevation for the retaining wall, and that has uh, that has actually changed. And so there's an updated report uh, that's in your packet, and you have an exhibit that's in front of you that uh, it's. Uh, probably not legible on an 11 by 17. I noticed that after it was printed out. Um, but what it will tell you is that um, they're proposing a 6.78 foot uh, retaining wall uh, along, the, along the street where that sidewalk is to hold up that, uh, that dirt so that way you can also have the building that's there. I think there's some discussion about uh, this might facilitate some additional green space between the sidewalk and the edge of that wall. Is that right? Yep. And um, uh, I think originally as it was designed, that sidewalk was going to be right up on the retaining wall. And so now we're trying to get a little bit of buffer between, uh, between the two. Actually, it's a little bit of the opposite, the opposite direction. Right, trying to push the sidewalk. Off the street. A little more green space okay. the Sorry, the maybe I misunderstood that. Uh, so uh, again, uh, this it would be a 2.78 foot variance for uh, for the retaining wall in the front yard. Typically, with retaining walls, they're limited to four feet when they're located in the front yard. Um, but a lot of what you're looking at is uh, from the aesthetic standpoint, the uh, rhythm of the street, and trying to ensure that um, a retaining wall does not block the view of the uh, home in the front yard. In this instance, the retaining wall is going to be below the grade of the street. Staff recommends support, and, and we, we support and recommend approval of both of the requested variances. Thank you, Ben. On behalf, respectfully, on behalf of the city. Yes. Um, respectfully. Oh. <laughs> questions from the commission. When is this uh, projected wall to be done, to be completed? When, would, when is the projected date? It started June of this year. Build back to where they need to be. It'll be a 
So no pool. <laughs> As an educator, that's what I'm saying. I think I can say that Mark is uh, Mark is pushing us as hard as he can to get this done. <laughs> um, I think my question is, uh, I mean, I don't have a, a problem with the wall height or the build tube line. I, my question is just about the wall placement and having, you know, whatever it is now, a, a six and a half foot wall right there, but up against the sidewalk and having traffic along the sidewalk and then people milling about seven feet below i mean is there any prospect for getting enough space for a little bit of a, a green buffer between those two well uh, honestly well so from the time we submitted this um, application for the variance request which was i guess about a month ago to uh well honestly last week there was a design change and, and honestly it was sort of the opposite we did have some green space between the retaining wall and the sidewalk and then a little green space between the the street and the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. and we really, uh, this was with the coordination with Mark, we really decided that we felt like it was best for the project and best for public safety if we could push this sidewalk further away from the street, which, which is really, this is the reason the, the height changed slightly from the original request to what we're here today requesting. I mean, there will be fall protection. In fact, there will be a fence for securing the site. Uh, so it shouldn't be any risk of someone falling off the wall down into the yeah. pool area. And, and I think it's worth pointing out that uh, not the entire wall is 6.17 feet or whatever it is. It's, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, the far east end of the wall is the tallest. It gets up to that, mm -hmm. that maximum elevation. It gradually gets shorter as you go west down to a couple feet. And really, we actually looked today at Mark's request at uh, kind of the average height of the wall across the frontage of the property. And it's just barely over four feet. Uh, mm -hmm. So really, if you just look at the average height of the wall. And, and as Ben pointed out, the, um, the wall is facing away from the street, so you, you really don't see the wall. There's a retaining wall there now that's doing exactly what we're proposing, but it's, yeah. uh, it's in not the best shape. And, and we're trying to maximize the space available for um, kind of functionality of the pool site. I mean, and, and as Ben also mentioned, you know, the, the pool shell, the footprint of the pool itself is staying where it is, which is part of what's kind of creating this um, challenge with the space constraints but uh but the, the good news is everything else the pool deck the buildings the parking we're reworking all that to make it mm -hmm. more functional to make it work well uh, we're working with mccarty architects i should give them credit they're involved as well we're on the team yeah. with them i mean I, I understand pushing the sidewalk away from the street i mean to be honest we're more of not so much an either or commission more of an and can we get <laughs> buffer on both sides <laughs> Well, I, again, this was part of the discussion, you know, when you get too little of a green strip, it really just becomes something that's not really maintainable, nothing really grows yeah. there. We've seen that with, you know, the, the, the city's current ordinance uh, and it says you, you have to have at least two feet of green a verge or a green, you know, planted strip between the, the curb on the street and the sidewalk, at least two feet. But what we see over and over again is that two feet doesn't always work out that well. It's a little close for pedestrians. It doesn't really uh, mm -hmm. give an opportunity to plant. So we've actually moved that wall or the sidewalk back where it's actually, again, it's, it's butted right up on the retaining wall, uh, but it gives almost four feet, I think, or so of, of kind of a, a grass strip or an opportunity for maybe yeah. some planting where, and where we can without blocking view of uh, vehicles leaving the site. Hey, Mark. Right. Yeah. So yeah. We're reworking basically everything from the edge of the street south, other than the shell of the pool, is getting reworked to make it more functional and safe. And at the top of the retaining wall, you'll have to have a fence, right? That's what, right. What's that going to look like? It's going to be a 42 inch. It's a guardrail for the sidewalk. It's required to have it because of the mm -hmm. distance of the drop right there. Paul, do we know where there's steps? Uh, where the steps come into the site, I, I think it's around four feet in that area. I think the taller portion of the wall is more on the east end of the site. That's right. It's on yeah. the extreme. But I mean, all of that. So, over the road. Yeah, I mean, where the stairs, where the new proposed stairs enter into the site to the new uh, building, it's um, about three and a half feet. Yeah. Right I mean, I guess what I'm worried about is really just the section of sidewalk between the stairs and the end of the retaining wall. And what's going to stop i mean one just to make sure that it's safe for kids because there are going to be kids leaving the pool or coming to the pool down through there going to school whatever um and two 
whatever hijinks they get up to dropping stuff over the side of the wall and, and that kind of thing. So that's my concern is just getting a little bit of separation or some sort of viable fence there. Yeah. Will there not be a fence that actually secures the site running along? I think it would be a be typical be. fall fence. Right. I mean, it has to be at least 42 inches to provide yeah. fall protection. Or, uh, it's yeah. 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 And 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 I guess for what it's worth, the uh, the fence actually will be separated some from the wall. Uh, I should okay. have pointed that out. It's. Um, well, here, here. I think I may have this. We're going to set this down. I think I see maybe a last minute here. Yeah, see? Um, so we're actually, we're making the sidewalks. This is the fence? That's right. We're making the sidewalks. It's about half the other way. We're going to put it right up to the wall here. But we're actually offsetting the fence. Okay. That's better. Yeah. It's a much bigger picture yeah. than this. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'll be zooming that in. All right. Does anybody else have a question? Anyone from the audience wish to speak or have a question? Anyone online? If not, is there a motion on case 3073 for, there are two parts, the first part, a variance for the front yard built to minimum standards? Motion to approve. There is a motion to approve. Uh, is there a second? Second. Second. Second to Commissioner Logan. All in favor? Commissioner Milam, how do you vote? Uh, yes. Commissioner Spragans. Yes. All right, and then on the second part, is there a motion on the variance for the retaining wall height? There's a motion to approve from Commissioner Murphy. Is there a second? Second. There's a second. All in favor? Commissioner Milam, how do you vote? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Spragans. Yes. All right. The variances are approved. That brings us to our final case. Case number 3074. The City of Oxford has filed a request for modifications to the Land Development Code. This okay. is uh, what we might call, how, uh, in the biz, we might call this housekeeping. Okay. Um, the uh, modifications that we're proposing in this instance are, are um, really not actually changing anything it's just a rewording and so what we're what we've proposed actually is more of a chart style um, we hear concerns from developers and app um, engineers prof design professionals about um, actually we get them we get calls all the time for clarifications or just to make sure hey am i reading this right and we just thought it would be easier to simplify with the parking required for the residential purposes, what's required for each individual unit, but then also what's required from a guest standpoint. So that's what's before you here for all of the, uh, for detached, for zero lot line, for townhouses, for duplex, triplex, and quadplex, and then also for multifamily. Thank you, Ben. So it's really the same language, it's just presented differently. Any questions? The city recommends approval. Respectfully, we do. Okay. All right. Anyone from the audience or online? <coughs> if not, is there a motion on case number 3074 for modifications to the land development code? Motion to approve. Motion to approve from Commissioner Murphy. Is there a second? Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Commissioner Milam. Yeah. Commissioner Spragans. Yes. It's approved. They're going to make the motion to adjourn, right? Uh, does anyone online have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. I make a motion to adjourn. <laughs> That's a second. <laughs> All in favor. Aye. 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 Aye.